Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Optimizing Homology-Directed Repair Results with CRISPR-Cas9. I am Brenda Kelly Kim of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's webinar is presented by LabRoots and sponsored by GE Healthcare. GE Healthcare continues to be an innovator in the field of gene editing and CRISPR-Cas9 research, launching the very first synthetic CRISPR-Cas9 guide RNA solution and now offering one of the most comprehensive gene editing portfolios in the industry, GE remains focused to developing the most effective research tools for their customers. For more information about GE's CRISPR-Cas9 solutions, please visit www.gelifesciences.com slash CRISPR. You can submit questions during this interactive event by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. John Scheel. John Scheel is a research scientist at Dharmacon, part of GE Healthcare, and develops research tools for RNA interference and CRISPR-Cas9 genome engineering. He received his Bachelor of Science degree in biochemistry at Colorado State University and his PhD degree in cell biology at the University of Colorado. He also completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. I will now turn it over to Dr. Scheel for his presentation. Hi, and welcome, everyone. Thank you, Brenda, for that introduction, and thanks to everyone for joining us today. As Brenda said, I'm a research scientist here at GE Healthcare, and today I want to talk to you about optimizing homology-directed repair results with CRISPR-Cas9. For today's webinar, I'll be discussing CRISPR-Cas9 and the dual synthetic RNA approach. I'll go into homology-directed repair, also known as HDR, and I'll do this with CRISPR-Cas9. I'll go into some of the background uh, with HDR and CRISPR-Cas9, and then also go into some examples, uh, such as insertion of short DNA sequences with HDR in a synthetic DNA oligo, and then also an example where we insert an N-terminal GFP tag uh, by using a donor plasmid. Okay, so on to our first topic, CRISPR-Cas9 and the dual synthetic RNA approach. Many of you have likely done a lot of gene editing using CRISPR-Cas9, but I want to describe the mechanism to be sure that we are all using the same words and definitions. There are three important components the CRISPR RNA, the transactivating small RNA, or tracer RNA, and the Cas9 nuclease. The active CRISPR RNA is comprised of 20 nucleotides of spacer-derived sequence and 22 nucleotides of repeat-derived sequence, as depicted in the cartoon off to the right of this slide. Each CRISPR RNA hybridizes to a transcribed tracer RNA through a repeat-derived sequence found on the CRISPR RNA to form a CRISPR RNA tracer RNA hybrid. Now, it is this hybrid RNA complex that loads into Cas9 and guides the Cas9 protein to cleave the DNA target site adjacent to the protospacer adjacent motif, also referred to as a PAM site. As we all know by now, CRISPR Cas9 gene editing was demonstrated in human and mouse cells starting in 2012 with several important publications from Dr. Charpentier, Doudna, Church, and Zhang. On the top right of this slide is an interesting concept that was demonstrated by these groups, whereby the CRISPR RNA and tracer RNA were actually fused together by a linker loop to form a single guide RNA molecule that was able to be expressed on a plasmid. Since then, there have been hundreds of publications utilizing CRISPR-Cas9 system in mammalian cells as well as many other organisms such as zebrafish, C. elegans, and pigs, and the list goes on and on. The utility of CRISPR-Cas9 has revolutionized how quickly we can knock out genes to address our biological questions. 
At GE Healthcare, we offer the editor line of products that enable researchers to use Cas9 to induce a double-strand break within your genome of interest. Once a double-strand break is generated by Cas9, the cell can initiate various DNA repair mechanisms. A common repair mechanism that is used by the cell is non-homologous end-joining, or NHEJ for short. This repair pathway is often imprecise as it joins the two broken ends of DNA and forms various sized insertions and deletions, also known as indels. An alternate repair pathway that the cell is able to employ is homology-directed repair. This repair pathway is a precise repair pathway that needs a donor template to guide the broken DNA back into place. This donor template can come endogenously from the cell in the form of a sister chromatid, or can also be introduced into the cell in the form of a synthetic DNA oligo or a donor plasmid. Researchers have utilized HDR to make precise modifications in different cell lines and model organisms. They are correcting mutated gene alleles, knocking in large expression cassettes into genomic safe harbor sites, and even tagging their genes of interest with the GFP or other fluorescent proteins. When designing a CRISPR experiment for NHEJ, the researcher needs to decide the source of Cas9 and also the source of guide RNA. There are many different ones to choose from, so I wanted to go over those now. Here at GE, we offer Cas9 in several forms, such as pre-made lentiviral particles, that enabled the creation of a stably expressing Cas9 line. These lentiviral particles come in different promoter options as depicted here. These different promoters will help ensure maximum expression in your cell line of interest. Similar to our Cas9 lentiviral particles, we also offer Cas9 expression plasmids that have the same promoter options. These Cas9 plasmids have the additional benefit of having the flexibility of expressing either MK2, so a far red fluorescent protein, or a pure myosin resistance gene with a T2A fusion, so a self-cleaving peptide with Cas9. We also have two Cas9 DNA-free options in the form of Cas9 mRNA and Cas9 recombinant protein. When selecting a source of the guide RNA, we also have a few different options to decide between. Utilizing our experience at making synthetic RNA, we are able to make synthetic CRISPR RNA and synthetic tracer RNA. I'll go into this a little bit more detail later on. We also offer single guide RNAs as lentiviral particles for difficult to transfect cells. Lastly, we're able to leverage our patented chemistry to be able to synthesize this long synthetic single guide RNA. It is important to say that any of our Cas9 products on the left-hand side of this slide are compatible with any of the guide RNA sources on the right-hand side of this slide. All these different choices are important because, as you will see later on, maximizing double-strand breaks in your system will increase chances of getting your desired HDR modification. Now, when performing an experiment that will utilize HDR, you also need to consider the source of the donor template. Common DNA templates that are used are synthetic DNA oligos and donor plasmids. Again, I'll talk a little bit more about these later when I get into specific examples utilizing a single-stranded DNA oligo and utilizing a DNA donor plasmid. But first, I want to get back into choosing guide RNA. So let's discuss this in a little bit more detail. Currently, the guide RNA is offered either as a single molecule vector express single guide RNA or as an RNA-based guide RNA that can be in the form of a single or dual RNA system. As I list on this slide, the vector-based single guide RNA expresses CRISPR RNA and tracer RNA as a single molecule, which enables enrichment for the sgRNA when introduced into cells. You can also use this sgRNA system to perform lentiviral pooled screening. On the other hand, RNA-based guide RNAs have transient activity that do not have a risk of DNA integration. These are easily transfectable and can be used to perform array screening. In 2014, we were the first company to employ the synthetic dual RNA approach for CRISPR-Cas9 guide RNAs with the launch of our editor product line. This synthetic dual RNA system is exactly like the natural bacterial system, 
with a custom synthetic RNA comprising the 22, 20 nucleotide target sequence and the 22 nucleotide fixed S. pyogenes repeat sequence. This CRISPR RNA will bind to our tracer RNA, which we also make synthetically. We believe this approach makes it easier for the researcher because it does not require cloning to generate your guide RNA. Additionally, with this being a synthetic RNA system, it provides the possibility of chemical modifications to enhance functionality and to perform arrayed screens using phenotypes that are not amenable to pooled screens. Now paying attention to the tracer RNA, here at GE Healthcare DharmaCon, our patented 2 prime ACE chemistry is really ideal for the synthesis of long RNA, such as this 40, 74 nucleotide tracer RNA. This chemistry provides fast coupling rates, high yields, and greater purity than traditional RNA protection strategies. On the left-hand side of this slide is a UPL trace of our editor tracer RNA, demonstrating the high-quality RNA that is routinely synthesized by Dharmacon. So with all of these reagents in mind, I would like to speak about using them to perform homology-directed repair. One thing to note, though, in many cell types, NATJ dominates DNA repair during G1, S, and G2 phases of the cell cycle, whereas HDR is restricted to late S and G2 phases of the cell cycle when DNA replication has completed and sister chromatids are available to serve as repair templates. However, even in late S and G2, NATJ is still active, still competing with HDR, and it is often more efficient at repairing double-strand DNA breaks. Now, when the CRISPR craze began in 2012 and 2013, researchers were able to demonstrate the utility of using CRISPR-Cas9 with HDR. For example, Ran et al., uh, so the, tar the chart at the top left of the screen shows varying levels of HDR efficiency at different CRISPR sites, and these levels varied between the wild-type Cas9 and the Cas9 NICase. Additionally, Rats et al. and other researchers have been able to knock in GSP tags under the expression of the endogenous gene targets, and so this is shown in the, the top right part of this slide. And these groups were also able to show that the advantages over these methods over traditional GSP overexpression plasmids. And lastly, at the bottom of this slide, Lynn et al. were able to synchronize cells in various stages of the cell cycle using the cotazole synchronization, and they synchronized these cells at the G2M boundary of the cell cycle. And they were able to show that HDR knock-in rates across all donors tested were increased. When thinking of designing an HDR experiment, you will need a method to determine whether or not your HDR experiment worked. I'm sure many of you are familiar with most of these methods, but here I have listed some of the most common methods used to identify successful HDR gene editing. The first method I list is PCR-based detection assays that require the amplification of specific genomic regions around your HDR target site. Junctional PCR requires PCR primer specific to the HDR change that you are making, and another primer to a nearby genomic sequence. Amplification with this primer pair allows you to gauge if your experiment has worked or not. The Restriction Fragment Length Polymorphism Assay, or RIFLIP for short, requires a restriction enzyme site to be present in the PCR product. And successful HDR will either create or remove the restriction enzyme site. And this can be easily detected when the PCR product is digested with the restriction enzyme and ran out on an agarose gel. Next, fluorescent reporters are pretty straightforward. You just need to visualize uh, to confirm uh, the correct localization. And lastly, Sanger sequencing of the genomic region involved in your HDR experiment will also allow you to identify if you have performed successful HDR. Now I want to get into some of the details about choosing a CRISPR target site for HDR gene modification. You need to consider three factors when picking this target site. The first one, the Cas9 activity at the target site. 
the second, the specificity of the CRISPR target site, and finally, the double strand break distance from the insertion site. On the right side of this slide, Elliot et al. has performed an experiment looking at HDR repair events at varying distances away from the double stranded break. As they show in this graph, HDR repair events drop off quickly as you move away from the same HDR insertion site and the double strand break site. At an approximate 10 nucleotide distance between the HDR insertion site and the double strand break site, the detected HDR conversion percent is 83% of the original activity. This activity drops considerably as soon as this distance is around 100 nucleotides and this detected HDR conversion percent is around 13 and 16%. With this in mind, it is recommended to balance these three factors. Again, Cas9 activity at the target site, the specificity of the guide RNA, and the double strand break distance from the insert site. And these will allow you to maximize your chances for a successful HDR gene editing event. Now you need to design a CRISPR RNA for your genomic site of interest by identifying CRISPR sequences near your HDR site, all the while keeping in mind the distance between your Cas9 cut and your intended HDR insertion site. Also keeping in mind CRISPR RNA specificity and functionality, and some of these factors might require a trade-off in some experimental design cases. We provide a tool on our website that allows you to input a specific genomic sequence to identify CRISPR sequences and design CRISPR RNAs. The link to this tool is at the bottom of this screen. So for example, I have chosen the SEC61 beta gene. You'll see more on this gene later on. And I have copied and pasted a 40 nucleotide genomic region where I would like to cut with Cas9. And within this region, it contains the gene start codon, and it is highlighted here in yellow. If I want, I can enable a rigorous specificity check using the Enable Specificity Check checkbox. This ensures that only the most specific CRISPR sites will be returned back to me. With all this information put into the design tool, I can click on the Generate Designs button and our CRISPR design tool identifies six different CRISPR RNAs that are located within this region. I am now able to easily order these synthetic CRISPR RNAs and move on to my transfection. Now I would like to get into the examples that we have performed demonstrating insertion of short DNA sequences with HDR and a synthetic DNA oligo. Here is a workflow that we use to maximize the outcomes of our experiments for HDR of short inserts. First, design CRISPR RNAs in your region of interest. Second, test each CRISPR RNA to determine which CRISPR RNA has the highest gene editing efficiency. In some circumstances, this can be just more than one or two CRISPR RNAs. The third step is to design and order synthetic DNA donor oligos with homology arms surrounding your HDR target region. The fourth step is to optimize your transfection conditions of your Cas9, your CRISPR RNA and tracer RNA, and your donor oligo to ensure maximum gene editing results. Lastly, it is strongly recommended to always verify that your intended HDR modification is incorporated into your cell line as you have planned it. When designing synthetic oligo donors, you need to locate your gene target and determine where it is you want to make this HDR modification. In the cartoon at the top of this slide, I have drawn out a design example where three blue rectangle shaped exons are spaced out by introns. Let's say I want to target exon three, and here I list the target region sequence below the top cartoon. On this sequence, the CRISPR RNA location that I have previously determined to be the best for this experiment is shaded in the gray box next to the PAM in the red text. I've also colored the stop codon in green that I'll be using for this example. Next, you will need to identify the type of HDR modification that you'll want to introduce near the CRISPR RNA site. Two examples demonstrated on this slide are replacing a SNP or inserting a C-terminal epitope tag, such as a 1x flag tag, 
and you would do this right before the gene stop codon. We then place homology arms specific to the gene of interest surrounding the HDR modification that we want to introduce. Another DNA donor design aspect that you need to consider is the need to modify the Cas9 target sequence in the donor to prevent subsequent Cas9 cleavage in your HDR repaired alleles. In this same generic gene example, we need to focus on the CRISPR RNA sequence in the PAM sequence. The first way to prevent Cas9 cutting is by placing the desired HDR modification somewhere in your CRISPR RNA sequence or in the PAM sequence as demonstrated in design example one. So in this design example one, we have placed a 12 nucleotide insert at the end of the CRISPR RNA sequence, preventing the CRISPR RNA from recognizing this site if it were uh, HDR to, were to occur. So the Cas9 won't be able to cleave this site once HDR occurs. So the second design example, or another method of disrupting a CRISPR RNA site is by making nucleotide substitution within the PAM or the CRISPR targeting region as illustrated here. And so I've marked these by purple nucleotides and also emphasized them with asterisks below. And so this design example is most often encountered when one of your homology arms contains the full CRISPR RNA targeting sequence next to a PAM site. Now, with all these design considerations taken into account, let's move into some of the experimental data and look into how to maximize CRISPR-Cas9 double-strand breaks. The gene for this example that we are targeting is VCP, and the sequence that we'll be targeting is shown at the top of this slide. The CRISPR RNA target sequence is highlighted by the gray box, and again, next to the PAM in red. We use different Cas9 sources for the experiment, a uh, Cas9 plasmid that was not selected for after transfection, a Cas9 plasmid that was selected for with pyromycin, and a Cas9 stably integrated cell line. With these different Cas9 sources, we also transfected in synthetic CRISPR RNA and tracer RNA to determine which method generated the most indels. As we see in this mismatched detection assay, ran out on inaugurose gel 72 hours after transfection, indel amounts are increased as we use the pure myosin selection or our Cas9 integrated cell line over the, the Cas9 plasma transfection that was not selected for. Now with this knowledge, we wanted to perform HDR with the indicated donor template here. So this donor template is 10 nucleotides that we're trying to insert, uh, six of which create an NHE1 restriction enzyme site. So we'll use this synthetic DNA oligo and we'll place 30 nucleotide homology arms surrounding this 10 nucleotide insert. And so our intended HDR edited locus is shown here in the middle of this slide. When performing the same transfection as before with Cas9, CRISPR RNA, and tracer RNA, we now include our donor DNA template into this transfection mixture and performed a RIFLIP assay with the NHE1 restriction enzyme. What we saw is that as you increase the number of double-strand breaks available for HDR, you get an increase in HDR with the Cas9 integrated cell line having the highest percentage of indels and HDR. And so by looking at this, just comparing the T71 data on the left and also the HDR on the right, you see that the Cas9 with no selection and pure myosin selection and the integrated line increase as you go from left to right. And the same thing happens when you perform the HDR transfection. So in our second example, we wanted to introduce an NHE1 restriction enzyme site and the C terminal tag at EMX1 and the targeted sequence is displayed here. We wanted to place this insert just before the stop codon in green to make a C terminal epitope tag. We performed our transfections in our Cas9 integrated line with synthetic CRISPR RNA, tracer RNA, and donor template. Again, we waited 72 hours post-transfection and plated out single cells into individual wells of a 96-well plate. And subsequently, we Sanger sequenced all these cells once they grew to sufficient size. The type of data that we get back in this experiment is displayed here. The wild type sequence in at the top of this slide the intended HDR edit sequence is below that, 
and four chromatograms from selected individual clonal lines are aligned to the HDR edited sequence. The first clone is the wild type sequence that does not contain an intended HDR insertion. The second clone contains an insertion in some but not all of the alleles. You can see that on the right of this chromatogram is a clear sequence identical to the wild type sequence. However, once you get within the CRISPR RNA and PAM region, you start to see multiple nucleotide peaks. If you look carefully, you can identify the flag insertion. The third clone is an example where all alleles in this cell line have integrated the flag tag insertion. Lastly, which is actually really interesting for us, is a fourth cell clone that contains an incomplete insertion of the flag tag and actually has a single nucleotide deletion. Lastly, we wanted to determine the optimal homology arm length for maximal knock-in. To do this, we used our two previously targeted gene targets, MX1 and VCP, with a 10 or 12 nucleotide insert. And so with each insert, we appended on different homology arm lengths, starting with 10 nucleotides per homology arm, and then we increased this all the way up to 70 nucleotides per homology arm. And as this graph shows, uh, we performed a RIFLIP assay with that NHE1 restriction enzyme and looked at cell population and plot HDR as a percent of the total cell population. So with 10 nucleotide homology arms, we are unable to detect HDR. But as soon as you increase these arms to 20 nucleotides per arm, you begin to see HDR occur at these sites. You add an additional 10, so 30 nucleotide homology arms, you see this become less variable, and then these results or the efficiencies remain consistent until you get up to the 60 or 70 of the longer uh, homology arms. And so we were unable to confirm why we had this drop off, but it seemed consistent with the literature. So we recommend homology arm lengths between 30 and 40 nucleotides. Now I'd like to transition into performing HDR with larger inserts such as a GSP tag. The workflow for this example is mostly the same as the short insert workflow, except for step three. Here, instead of ordering a synthetic donor construct, you actually have to do a little cloning and construct a donor plasmid containing homology arms flanking the GFP tag. To perform this, we used PCR homology arms of 1,000 nucleotides from U2S cells and it is the same cells that we intended to perform our HDR gene editing in. We utilized ligation-free methods to directionally assemble our donor plasmid so that TurboGFP is right in the middle of the 5' prime and 3' prime homology arms. We have designed our PCR primers to the 5' prime homology ends right after the start, the start codon, and the 3' prime homology arm begins with the first base normally after the start codon. We constructed one such donor using this approach to target the SEC61 beta gene. When performing our transfections with only this donor plasmid, we noticed cytosolic turbo-GFP expression from the donor plasmid, as seen on the left-hand side of this slide. To be clear, this transfection did not contain Cas9, nor CRISPR RNA or tracer RNA. To get around this plasmid-based turbo-GFP expression, we monitored the TurboGFP fluorescence over the course of a week and found that at day seven post-transfection, TurboGFP expression was less than 0.5%. Thus, we used this time point for our future transfections to try and tag SEC61 beta with TurboGFP. In our subsequent experiments, we used flow cytometry to sort our fluorescent cells. When performing FACs, we first gate for healthy cells, as depicted on the left scatter plot, whereby we isolate the healthy cells away from the dead cells and small cell debris. Once we have this healthy cell population, the right-hand side of this slide shows the second gating step that we perform, where we select for single cells and avoid any clumps uh, of two or more cells. Now that we have the desired healthy cell population, we can sort based off of fluorescence. Here is flow cytometry data from untransfected U2OS cells showing gating 
of this negative population to separate true GFP positives from the natural autofluorescence that can be detected in the negative population. When we look at data from our donor-only control, which is the scatter plot to the left hand side of this slide, this scatter plot shows the minimal background fluorescence coming from the donor plasmid that we previously determined would be there from the data a few slides ago. Now on the right hand side of this slide, we show the scatter plot of cells transfected with Cas9 mRNA, CRISPR RNA, tracer RNA, and our donor vector. And we see that 5% of the cell population now expresses TurboGSP. But the next question we wanted to answer was whether or not this TurboGSP expression was localizing to the correct place. We find that sex 61 beta, a component of the protein translocation apparatus of the ER membrane, does in fact localize to the correct place. We fluorescently sorted over 130 TurboGFP positive cells and found that 98.5% of the single cell clones displayed the right localization. We further confirmed this correct localization with immunofluorescent staining of sex 61 beta as pictured on the lower left-hand side of this slide. Lastly, we harvested genomic lysate from a handful of these clonal cell lines and designed PCR primers to amplify the region containing the intended TurboGFP insert, as depicted on the top part of this slide. These primers span the TurboGFP insertion site, and if we successfully get integration into this site, the size of the PCR amplicon increases by approximately 700 base pairs. When looking at untransfected cells, and TurboGFP sorted cells that actually lost TurboGFP expression after flow cytometry, the PCR band sizes display the predicted non-insert PCR band size of 507 base pairs. Now let's take a look at clone number two. That shows correct localization of TurboGFP and sex 61 beta. Here we see an increased PCR amplicon size where TurboGFP was integrated at all alleles present. This was further confirmed via Sanger sequencing at the bottom of this slide. Clone three and four contain some extra gene editing events that underscore the need to carefully characterize your resulting cell line after performing your desired gene edit. Via Sanger sequencing, we determined that in addition to the desired turbo GFP integration, at least one of the alleles in clone three contains 107 base pair deletion. And that's the band about 100 base pairs lower than the wild type band, as you see in this gel. We found that clone 4 contains an allele with an incomplete addition of turbo GFP. Again, an additional band running lower than the expected size uh, of the turbo GFP insertion. I would like to conclude with these general tips for performing HDR workflows with CRISPR-Cas9. When picking a CRISPR RNA, you need to balance location, functionality, and specificity. And oftentimes, you need to test two to three or sometimes more CRISPR RNAs to do this. Secondly, you need to optimize your transfection. The more double-strand breaks will give more DNA ends to be repaired with HDR. Third, disrupt your CRISPR site in your donor DNA. You can do this by changing the PAM site or disrupting the CRISPR RNA target site. And lastly, always sequence your resulting HDR cell line. Here are a list of resources that we provide on our website that will hopefully be helpful for those looking for more information about CRISPR-Cas9 and HDR. So we have various application notes with detailed protocols and recommendations. We have other webinars, uh, such as two listed here. Uh, topics include uh, improved CRISPR-Cas9 experiments with rationally designed guard RNAs, and also a CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing with synthetic RNA from start to finish webinar. And lastly, we also have a couple posters as we attend academic conferences, uh, one such listed here, where we talk about designing highly functional and specific guide RNAs for knockout and achieving precise knock-in using the homology-directed repair pathway. And with that, I'd like to hand it back to Brenda at Labrids. Thank you. 
Thank you, John, for that informative presentation. While we're getting ready for the Q&A session, two polling questions will appear on the screen. We'd appreciate your answers to these questions so we can follow up appropriately with you. For the question and answer session, I'd like to remind our audience how to submit their questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many of your questions as we can today. And we do have our first question. If you introduce a mutation, can you transfect the donor DNA together with the CRISPR RNA or in a different transfection? And so that is a good question and one that we uh, wondered as we started these uh, experiments. So in our experimental workflows, we do transfect the donor DNA template, either the synthetic oligo or donor plasmid, with our Cas9 and guide RNA all at the same time. In fact, now we actually highly recommend people to do this to ensure that the donor template is inside the cell at the time the Cas9 cuts the DNA target. Because if it's added after this cut, then it, it's too late and the cell can't use that template. Great. Our next question, is the Cas9 Nikkei's better than wild type Cas9 for HDR purposes? So I like using the wild type Cas9 uh, this is mostly due to the increased activity of creating a double-strand break. You can use the Cas9 Nikkei's, uh, but a as many of you know, it would require two different CRISPR sequences to generate a double-stranded break, and this is where it might be difficult depending on what sequence uh, you're trying to target, so the sequence surrounding your genomic target might not always be uh, efficient to use this two uh, CRISPR sequences with the Cas9 Nikkei's. I see. We have another question. How long do the homology arms have to be? Okay, so I, I presented data on this, uh, and it was a question we had as well. So for synthetic DNA oligos, uh, we have found that 30 to 40 nucleotide homology arms uh, are sufficient to do these knock-in experiments. And then when using donor plasmids, uh, homology arm lengths between 500 to 1,000 nucleotides have really worked well for us. Great. Another question. What if there isn't a PAM site near where I want to do my insertion? Okay, well, without seeing the sequence of your intended gene target, I can only provide some general guidance. Uh, I do like the insert and the Cas9 cut site to be as close as possible. This is to ensure maximum efficiency of HDR. However, several publications have had successes with the distance uh, between the insertion site and the Cas9 cut site when this is a large distance. In these examples, the labs have used a donor plasmid design with a positive selection marker. So this selection marker was either a fluorescent protein or a different antibiotic resistance so that they could select for these cells. However, every HDR experiment is unique, and so you will have to adapt a potentially a different approach depending on what your specific experimental requirements are. Great. Our next question, what is the estimated percentage of HDR knock-in with CRISPR-Cas9? So in our experiments and just reading through literature, uh, for short inserts using synthetic donor templates, we here have seen knock-in efficiencies greater than 20% of the cell population containing at least a, one modified allele. For larger knock-ins, uh, using a donor plasmid, we have seen the sufficiencies drop, uh, but they are greater than 10% when trying to insert a GSP tag, and this is when using an integrated Cas9 cell line. So more regularly, uh, we see that GSP tagging efficiencies are around 1% to 5% when not using a Cas9 integrated cell population. But with that, I do want to caution that we have seen efficiencies across the board, and they're highly variable, and some genomic positions will have much less than 1% knock-in efficiencies. Okay. Our next question, how, sh how close should the homology arms of the repair template be to the cut site? Should it be immediately flanking the cut site? or could it be 15 to 30 BP away from the cut site and still ensure high homologous recombination? Okay, so a two-part question. Uh, I'll, I'll 
go after the first question and then I'll go to the second. So for the first question, I always recommend that homology arms be as close as possible to maintain maximum HDR efficiencies. And so leading into that second part, uh, it can be possible uh, 15 to 30 base pairs away from the cut site. And I'll say that we have succeeded at detecting an insertion of a GFP tag into the C-terminus of a gene as far away as 50 nucleotides. Uh, but this knock-in efficiency was reduced, uh, but we're able to select for our cell line using that positive selection marker, so uh, GFP fluorescence using flow cytometry. So it, it is possible. Thanks. We have another question. If you are using a donor DNA sequence, do you see more consistent results for the heterozygous edits? Yes. I guess simply put, uh, this is largely dependent upon your cell line. So we do like to caution that uh, you need to know your cell line because uh, as uh, we all know, many cancer cell lines do have more than two alleles. So determining copy number of the, the gene that you're trying to target within your cell line will help uh, temper expectations of your HDR experiment. Okay, we do have time for just one more question. Um, does Dharmacon have a protocol for knocking in specific substitutions? Yes, uh, so we do have a general uh, protocol or, or workflow that people can follow. So this is an app note that we made available on our website last year. So this is for HDR-mediated insertion of short DNA sequences. And so this workflow can be followed to optimize the HDR-based gene editing in your cell line of interest. So I'd say take a look at that and then really just apply the principles there, such as optimizing your transfection, determining the, the, the best CRISPR to use, and, and so on, some of the things I've presented here to really try to help uh, get that HDR editing event in your desired cell line. Okay, that is all the time we have for questions. I'd like to remind our audience, if you've submitted a question through the Q&A button and it was not answered, someone will get back to you regarding your inquiry. If you have further questions that you did not submit during this broadcast, please email them to ts.dharmacon at ge.com. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through October of 2016. You'll be receiving an email from LabRoots to alert you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's event. I'd like to once again thank GE Healthcare for making this webcast possible and Dr. Shield for bringing this information to us. See you next time. Goodbye.